We will now turn our attention to the next macromolecule, carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are compounds containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The best known dietary carbohydrates are sugars like glucose and starch. If you look at the structure of the carbons, hydrogen, and oxygen, you will find that for every one carbon, there are one oxygen and two hydrogens. They are called carbohydrates because the basic compound of carbon and water are, co are combined. In fact, the basic structure is CnH2O-N. So carbon, hydrogen, or carbon water, or carbon hydrate. Now we'll dive further into the structures of carbs. Simple sugars have a formula C6H12O6. Ring structures containing either four or five carbon atoms and one oxygen and one oxygen atom. So one, two, three, four, five, and an oxygen or one, two, three, four, and an oxygen. The single sugars are called monosaccharides. Alpha and beta refer to the 3D position of the OH group. And the indicated carbons. So for instance, whether it's pointing down or whether it's pointing up. These arrangements dictate how they will link up in chains and how they will react in our bodies. Alpha is pointing down while beta is up. The fructose is shown as an, is an atypical upside down position. So for instance, OH is down, so therefore it's alpha. OH is up, so therefore it's beta. When many sugars are linked up together, you have a polysaccharide. And poly means many, which are natural polymers. Because the single sugars are either alpha or beta, two different linkages arise. When glucose polymerizes, the alpha linkage makes starch. Remember, alpha it was pointing down. And a beta linkage produces cell cellulose. Remember, the beta, the OH, was pointing up. So instead of going straight up, it's now angled up. Starch is the primary carbohydrate component of several foods, such as potatoes. Cellulose is the primary fibrous component of cell walls of plants. Glyco glycogen is a polysaccharide form of carbohydrate that is stored in our bodies. This is our storehouse for energy. We humans are able to digest starch, but we lack the enzymes to digest cellulose. When we talk about sugars, it's hard not to think about the obesity epidemic again. It seems like the in the 80s, people were obsessed with fat and getting rid of it in our diets. In the past decade or so, people have been obsessed with sugars, saying that this was the reason why people were overweight. In reality, it is all of it. We overindulge, and sugar is just one, of the more, one more example of it. We have tried to relieve the issue through science, for instance, artificial sweeteners. These two charts compare sweetness levels of different natural and artificial sweeteners. Notice that sucrose is exactly 100. 
This is because it is considered the baseline. Sucrose is what we consider table sugar. Now look at the second chart. These are artificial sweeteners. Notice that they are way higher in sweetness levels. It is still uncertain how these react in our bodies and what effects they have. We will now direct our attention to the last of the macro pro macromolecules, proteins. Proteins are an essential part of every living cell. They, also, they are also major components of hair, skin, and muscle, and they transport oxygen, nutrients, and minerals throughout the bloodstream. <coughs> Many of the hormones that act as chemical messengers are proteins, as are all the enzymes that catalyze the chemistry of life. Proteins are polyamides or polypeptides, polymers made up of amino acid monomers. The great majority of proteins are made from a various combination of only 20 different natural occurring amino acids. We discussed amino acids in the previous chapter. Proteins are made of amino acids. The general formula for an amino acid includes four groups attached to a single carbon atom, a carboxyl group, an amine group, a hydrogen, and then on the fourth side is the thing that changes that can actually be the reason why we have 20 different groups. The R group is the part of the amino acid that changes. This difference makes up for the great variations. For instance, here, it's just a hydrogen. Here, it's a CH3. So you see how that changes, but everything else remains the same. When two amino acids come together, water is given off and a peptide bond is formed. So here's water being given off. This OH and this hydrogen come together. And what's created, this nitrogen and this carbon coming together, is the peptide bond. The process may repeat itself over and over and over, creating a peptide chain. Once incorporated into the peptide chain, the amino acids are known as amino acid residues. The protein formed between both the amino acids present and the sequence of those amino acid residues is the, in the peptide. Food needs to be ingested regularly to replenish protein in the body, and these are constantly broken down and reconstructed. Some amino acids, called essential amino acids, cannot be synthesized by humans. They must be ingested by our diet. Therefore, a healthy diet requires both a, a good quantity and quality of proteins. Vitamins are considered micronutrients. These are substances that, you, that are needed in a minuscule amount, but are still essential to life. They are needed for good health, proper metabolic functioning, and preventing disease. Vitamins are defined by their properties. They are essential in the diet, although required in very small amounts. They are all organic molecules with a wide range of physiological functions. They generally are not used as a source of energy, although some of them help break down macronutrients. These are a couple of examples. Vitamin A, which is a fat-soluble 
and vitamin C, which is a water-soluble vitamin. There are two types of vitamins, fat-soluble like vitamin A and water-soluble like vitamin C, which are the exact same ones we mentioned in the previous slide. It is important to get both types of vitamins, but it is also important not to overdo it with the fat-soluble vitamins. The fat-soluble vitamins can be stored in your body, and if you ingest too much, you can actually have adverse effects. Water-soluble vitamins, however, are excreted from your body on a regular basis, so these are less of a threat. Excessive ingestion of vitamins are not common from food. Those who have problems take too many supplements. Minerals are ions or ionic compounds like vitamins have a wide, wide range of physiological functions. The important essential minerals are shown in, on this periodic table. In the, in the body, metallic elements can sit, typically exist as cations, things that are positively charged, and not in the nonmetals, usually in anions, negatively charged. Minerals are divided into two different, into three categories, depending on how much you need of them. You, won't, you need about one to two grams of the macro minerals, which include sodium, magnesium, and potassium. <coughs> you need less of the micro minerals, such as iron, copper, and zinc. But they are still important. For instance, you need iron for the blood cells. Finally, you only need tiny amounts of trace minerals like iodine and fluorine and manganese. The breaking of chemical bonds in glucose and oxygen molecules requires the absorption of energy. But the greater amount of energy that is released as carbon dioxide and waters are formed. The net release of energy is an example of an exothermic reaction. Different macronutrients contain different amounts of energy dependent on how much energy is stored in the chemical bonds. Carbohydrates and fats are primarily needed for energy, while proteins are needed for building blocks of the skin, muscles, tendons, ligaments, blood, and enzymes. Fats have less oxygen than carbohydrates and therefore need more oxygen to be absorbed to break down the compound. This result is more energy needed overall. So how many calories do you need to actually survive? Well, the absolute minimum amount that you need to consume for your body to function is also called your basal metabol metabolic rate. But this is just to survive. We, however, move around. So we need more energy than this. This chart provides an estimated calorie requirement. Notice that it's split between men and women, ages, and then in lifestyle. Check out what you average, what your average calorie should be on page 477 on your text. I have mentioned the obesity epidemic multiple times in this chapter. This is because it is a true problem. Weight issues can create additional health issues such as sore joints, heart problems, and a multitude of other ailments. Unfortunately, it was not too long ago that we, started, that we even started truly looking at what we ate. Since it's a relatively new science, it is still evolving. Back in the 50s, it was suggested that the four basic food groups 
Take a look at the quantity of meat that is suggested. At least two servings. They also group fruits and vegetables into one category. If you look at the food pyramid from the 90s, you'll notice that they increase the types of foods. Now, instead of having a minimum of two servings of meat, it limits you to two to three. Also notice the word serving rather than a specific quantity. Some people have, are confused by this because serving sizes change from one thing to the next. Americans not only eat the wrong thing, but they eat too much. Many people think of serving a bread is two slices because you need that's what's needed for a sandwich. According to the American Heart Association, a serving of bread is only one slice. A serving of meat is only two to three ounces, where a typical chicken breast is about twice that, sometimes more. The latest pyramid promotes more individuality. If you go to www.mypyramid.gov and navigate to what's called My Plan, you can register for your own information. It's actually kind of interesting and convenient. It tells you that the nutritional goals should be including fitness. Take a minute to check it out. You may have heard of the phrase, think global, act local. There are actually a lot of benefits to eating locally. You're helping the local economy by supporting the local farmers and businessmen. The food may taste better as well because they have a longer time to ripen. Take a look at this table on page 481 to see the positive effects of eating locally. Now that we have explored what it takes to be well nourished, let's discuss whether or not our planet is able to produce all the food that we need for everyone to be nourished. Like water shortages, food resources are not equally distributed around the globe. Many local and regional food shortages exist. Of the undernourished people worldwide, almost all live in underdeveloped countries, in developing countries. This map shows a location of countries facing serious food shortages. The darker the color, the greater the issue. There are several reasons for areas to have food shortages. Some are regional. Perhaps they live in an area where it's really hard to grow the food. Others are political. Areas where there are wars or other issues may cause shortage of food because they cannot travel to get to it. Fortunately, the percentage of undernourished individuals are decreasing with the exception of the desert areas. In fact, Asian areas have actually been able to reduce their percentage of undernourished individuals below the developed countries. It is predicted, however, in the next 20 years that the issue will begin to rise again as the population continues to grow. Although the exact science of nutrition is still being developed, we do know some basics. We know we need fats and carbs for energy. We know we need proteins to support our cells. We also need vitamins and minerals to support cellular activities, even though we do not provide any actual calories. The choices you make help support your body, your environment, and your economy.